Greenland, 1959, close to the North Pole. Heavy loads crawl across the ice at two miles an hour. The United States wants to transform this icy wasteland into a nuclear fortress and station their missiles here, no matter the cost. The US government offered to buy Greenland from Denmark, uh, and that happened uh, just after World War II. Uh, the price tag uh, was 100 million US dollars in gold. 200 soldiers will live in this city beneath the ice. The Cold War is heating up, and the US wants to show the Soviets just what its military is capable of. But the underground settlement is merely cover for a far crazier and top secret American military project. This chapter in the ice cold war between East and West sounds like a plot from a James Bond movie, but the story is true. Søren Gregersen was just 18 years old and straight out of high school. He becomes an eyewitness to the unusual project, and he keeps a diary of his experience along with several photos. I was invited to Camp Century by the U.S. Army. A nuclear reactor is to provide the underground town with heat and electricity. It becomes operational on the 2nd of October, 1960. After World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union grapple for supremacy. It's a race marked by new technology and ever more lethal weaponry. The Cold War between East and West is underway. In 1950, the Soviets helped the Chinese to beat back Western forces in Korea. In 1957, a triumphant Soviet Union marks the 40th anniversary of the October Revolution. The celebrations herald the dawn of a new era. The Red Army uses the May Day Parade to showcase its new military technology. The Soviet Union has just carried out the first successful intercontinental missile tests, leaving American efforts in the dust. The Communists also send the first satellites into orbit. Nineteen fifty seven becomes a year from hell for the USA. For three whole weeks, the satellite Sputnik transmits an acoustic signal around the globe. America is forced to take notice. The world looks on in amazement as the Soviets appear to win the space race. Their success is the best propaganda the communist leadership could ever hope for. In November that year, the United States suffers a further setback. Sputnik 2 carries the first living organism into orbit, a dog named Laika. The world follows the canine's journey through space, another unmistakable PR coup for the communist regime. American efforts to counter the Soviet success and finally launch their own satellite end in disaster. Despite this humiliation, the American public stand by their president. 
To drive back the communist threat, Eisenhower adopts a policy of nuclear deterrence. May the turbulence of our age yield to the true time of peace when men and nations shall share a life that honors the dignity of each. The US sets its sights on Greenland. Situated halfway between Washington and Moscow, American missiles could hit their Soviet targets with much greater accuracy. The US government people were beginning to realize that the Arctic areas would play a crucial role in the new Cold War. And for that reason, they thought it would be much easier if they controlled Greenland completely. But Greenland belongs to the Kingdom of Denmark. The Danes reject the American offer, but approve the construction of a large US airbase. In a logistical feat of strength, it takes the American soldiers just three months to build their airbase at Thule. Amphibious vehicles are employed as ferries to quickly unload the incoming supply ships. It's probably the, the largest engineering project in the Arctic ever, <laughs> when uh, the, the United States um, sent um, lots of cargo and many thousand men too, too late to establish an airbase that would allow uh, large uh, nuclear bombers to land, and it had about 12,000 people there. The airbase is built in secret, and the Air Force has trouble finding enough personnel willing to live in this remote part of the world. Chuck Rose, a military doctor, is sent to serve his country in this freezing wasteland. And so I just got my orders that says, I'm going to Thule Air Base, where, where's that? And, and the sergeant that answered the phone, he started laughing and laughing and laughing and laughing. I said, what's so funny? He says, that's the worst place in the world. He says, you're going to live under the ice for a whole year and you'll never get out and see the sun. In 1959, however, the United States begins an even more complex project, not far from Thule. They call it Camp Century. At this new site, the U.S. will carry out tests on people and material needed in the deployment of nuclear missiles. But where exactly in this vast polar desert should Camp Century be built? A human settlement nearly 100 feet below the surface of the ice has never been attempted. Colonel Kirkering, commander of the U.S. Army's Polar Research Center, is chosen to lead the project. And then you would have many thousand kilometers of tunnels under the ice with railroads. And on these railroads, you could have nuclear mi missiles running back and forth between uh, many uh, hundreds of launch sites. The US Army invests enormous sums of money and resources in the first ever subterranean military base in the Arctic. Supply shipments are soon crawling up the freshly laid road towards the ice cap, where they are transferred to sleds and sent onwards to Camp Century. The whole operation is filmed in color. This footage will later be shown to the public to trumpet the strength and capabilities of the American military. We call these convoys of 10 and 20 ton sleds heavy swings. Crawling up the ice cap at approximately two miles an hour, a heavy swing would reach the camp in about 70 hours if everything went well. Caterpillar tractors with extra wide treads pulled the heavy swing. Each tractor could pull from 50 to 100 tons. Finally, like a wagon train in the Old West, the first heavy swing got underway. It 
It is still officially summer when the harsh Arctic winter sets in. Construction will soon be put on hold. Fortunately, the workers already have somewhere to meet, sleep and relax. Camp Century will be built around 100 feet below the surface. The glacier underneath is nearly a mile thick. The engineers build the tunnel system from above. To do so, they must first dig 23 separate trenches. In the middle, the main trench, with channels branching off to the side for the accommodations and various technical facilities. A small nuclear reactor will provide the settlement with electricity and heat. The snow plows have been brought in from Switzerland, where they are used to clear the alpine passes during winter. At Camp Century, they dig further and further into the snow. In a matter of hours, metal arches are added to provide the tunnels with sturdy roofs. These are then covered in snow to disguise them from the outside world. The builders work around the clock in 12-hour shifts. Thanks to the Arctic summer, this is easily done. The nighttime is just as bright as the day. Due to the constant sunlight, the workers are plagued by headaches and sleeplessness. The army feeds its soldiers well. Every day, they get double-sized portions to keep their spirits up. 100 men live together in the construction camp, which will have to be dismantled once the subterranean town is finally complete. Black flags mark each finished tunnel, which years of fresh snowfall will soon bury completely. In summer 1960, the soldiers start building the camp's interior. On a foundation made from wooden planks, prefab houses, designed especially for Arctic conditions, are assembled. Each house was put together and tested back in the USA. They are heatable and specially insulated. Each kit can be assembled in a day. The temperature inside the ice tunnels is around minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit. And it must remain so for the tunnels to stay intact. The lateral tunnels each fit three houses, with 15 men to a house. In total, around 200 men will live at the camp. The openings are walled off with blocks of snow. This ensures Camp Century is completely invisible to the outside world. The blocks support each other, stabilizing the wall. A narrow entranceway allows people in and out. Each tunnel has an emergency shaft. The exits are the only part of Camp Century that can be seen above ground. The army sees to it that life in the construction site is captured on film especially the fun side. The documentary footage will be shown on American television screens as soon as possible. 
The army wants to show how far it will go to protect the American public, even in the most inhospitable corners of the world. They thought that um, if for some reason there were the nuclear threat to, uh, to continental homeland, <laughs> USA, would be too high, then people might want to live in these protected cities under the ice or in other places. At least that's how it was presented. But the opposing side is equally adept in their use of propaganda. While the US builds its nuclear fortress in Greenland, Nikita Khrushchev becomes the first Soviet leader to visit the enemy on home ground. The most powerful man behind the Iron Curtain brings his whole damn family with him, as one New York newspaper puts it, including his son, Sergei. In September 1959, Sergei is 24 years old. He is the party leader's only son. Today, he lives in the United States. Before that, and the Soviet propaganda, we thought that Western living in much poor condition that we are living, of course, was shock when we saw that in reality it is opposite. Khrushchev masters the art of smiling for the cameras and stages a PR coup for the communist side. He surprises his hosts with a copy of a badge that the Soviets had sent into space. He attempts to unsettle the Americans with talk of Moscow's extensive nuclear arsenal, which supposedly could hit the United States at any time. He was focused on the missiles, the one possibility really to reach American territory. But we have no missiles at that time. So he created this missile gap, threatening Americans. It was bluff. Khrushchev's missile bluff is a masterstroke of international politics. The Cold War is also a war of words. By the end of his two-week visit to the United States, the party leader has more than satisfied his own national interests. I remember when he told that we produce messages like sausages. And I told him, how you can tell this? We have only five missiles. And he answered, I'm not care how many missiles we have because it's important if we want to start the war, but I want to prevent the war. And I want Americans to believe that we strong enough, much stronger than we are. How strong the Soviet Union really is remains for the United States the burning question of the era. A spy plane is sent to collect intelligence on Soviet military capabilities. The U-2 can fly at a height of 20 miles, way beyond the reach of the enemy's anti-aircraft fire. At least that's what the Pentagon thinks. U-2 pilots repeatedly penetrate Soviet airspace and uncover one secret military base after another. They also blow the cover off Khrushchev's grand claims of nuclear superiority. Each reconnaissance flight is a flagrant breach of international law and, as such, must be personally approved by the US president. In May 1960, one US pilot fails to return. He has been shot down by one of the Soviet's newly developed anti-aircraft missiles and miraculously survives. He is to stand trial in Moscow, and Eisenhower's administration has some explaining to do as well. When we uh, admitted publicly that the U-2 belonged to us and it was on a reconnaissance mission, we were doing something that in a, in a modern world, that was the only way we could find out get any information on a closed, out about a closed society. But the United States soon strikes a counterblow in this propaganda war. 
At the United Nations, they reveal a bugging device discovered in the US Embassy in Moscow, proof of Soviet duplicity. The Marine Fiddler, a supply ship, docks in Thule. She brings with her the pieces for a nuclear reactor. Unlike the prefab houses, however, it has not been tested beforehand. The first assembling and tests will take place once it reaches Camp Century. It was also seen as the first step to outer space. So the idea was that if you could build a city under the ice in these um, difficult, uh, it's very difficult and hostile environment, then you could also establish a base on the moon or in outer space. And uh, so um, and this was um, yeah, science fiction in some ways, but presented through a real project, namely Camp Sentry. The vapor container, the largest single item in the power plant, was carried on a special flat bottom sled built expressly for its transport. Everything seemed fine the morning the heavy swing moved out. But unfortunately, it was only a few hours later that one of the worst storms of the season blew up. During the journey, winter sets in again. Getting everything ready on time becomes a race against the clock. September 1960. The soldiers in Camp Century are working flat out in 14-hour shifts. Fortunately, the steel housing for the nuclear reactor is almost complete. Due to the storm, the heavy swing needs longer than planned to reach the camp. It takes over a week to make the 120-mile journey from Thule. Its arrival at Camp Century is eagerly awaited. They really wanted people to think that you could live a comfortable life under the ice. You must remember this happened just after the Sputnik shock in 1957, right? When the Sputnik uh, flying over uh, the United States made some people think that we were behind the Soviet Union technologically. So they did everything they could to convince, you know, we have the technology, we have the, the manpower, we have everything and American values will prevail. What the Army's camera team are not allowed to film, however, is any testing of the nuclear missiles. Also not mentioned is the fact that some of the soldiers quartered next to the reactor are sleeping very badly. You have a nuclear reactor and uh, you have to live close to it and you never know what happens. I don't think that's a very nice uh, feeling. I mean, they didn't know what nuclear power was and they thought of a nuclear bomb or something that could explode any time, right? So that's why they didn't feel so great about it. And when they installed the nuclear reactor, there was a radiation problem. So they measured radi radiation in the tunnel and this radiation was far too high. It was unacceptably high. Uh, and so they shut it down. And this is during winter time, right? But they asked for big lead uh, plates so they could have a sort of a lead shielding a wall uh, around it. They started it up again. And this is when Søren Gregersen was there. You must ask him. In October 1960, two young men, both Boy Scouts, arrive in Thule. One of them is Søren. Both have been chosen for public relations work and will spend the winter as military technical assistants in Camp Century. I really didn't have a clue what to expect. I only knew that the US Army had built it, 
that a few people were living there. Søren Gregersen is 18, fresh out of high school. He barely speaks any English, but has a keen interest in nature and physics. He first travels to Thule, and then onwards to Camp Century. Søren may take photos almost anywhere he pleases. It sounded exciting, like an extension of my time as a scout. Kent, the American scout, becomes a good friend to Søren during their months under the ice. Our journey lasted 24 hours. Although we slept on the way, we were very tired by the time we arrived. Our route was marked by a series of flags, most of them in Camp Century. These are my memories of Camp Century and my diary. I took hundreds of photographs, and I was also given photos by the U.S. Army. U.S. Army photograph. In this picture, we can see two scouts standing at Camp Century in the snow. There was so much snow. My English was school English. Uh, it was not a strong point on my exam. I'd have uh, some uh, diary from any of the days, and uh, it has been typed uh, long, long, long time ago. You could say I have practiced typing. In Camp Century, I had never used a typewriter before. <laughs> so, there we are. It says in Danish, Monday, the 12th of December. Monday, 12th of December, 1960. Breakfast in the reactor zone. The swing transport has just arrived at the camp. We received the order to bring the food down into the main tunnel. After lunch, back to the control room. After lunch, upholt vi os lidt i kontrolrummet. I guess I was uh, maybe you could say it naive enough to say this is very exciting. There is a nuclear power plant very close to where I'm living. And it meant it was supposed to be beyond radiation danger. Uh, and that is what we are getting of words. And I took that. Uh, I have simply accepted that we are going to be protected and things are being measured around us. Uh, so that uh, it is shown that this is not dangerous. Søren Gregersen suffers no long-term health effects, despite his involvement in the radiation testing. To this day, he believes that the radiation levels around the reactor were safe. Each fuel rod, containing a pound of uranium-235, was carefully unpacked and cleaned by hand. For modern audiences, this footage is disturbing, as is the apparent lack of protective clothing. Starting the reactor up again was exciting for me. I was never concerned about what they were doing. It was new technology for me, and I was very curious about it. 
Og det var jeg interesseret i, det var jeg nysgerrig overfor. The workers had a bathhouse on site, where they could take hot showers. This was something new to Søren at the time. Camp Century consumes 10,000 gallons of fresh water per day. In doing so, they tap into what is for them a limitless natural resource. Underneath the camp, glacier ice is melted using hot steam, creating an underground lake. It provides drinking water, cools the reactor, and flushes the toilets. If you wanted to go to the toilet uh, at night, uh, you uh, simply had to uh, get out of it and put some clothes on, enough so that you could survive these minus 30 degrees. The underground settlement also has a modern infirmary, as well as recreation rooms, and a chapel that Søren visits from time to time. During my time, I saw the chaplain being the leader of the uh, whole team that was taking care of the nuclear reactor. He was a captain, and he was also taking care of God. If the camp was in need of something, it would get it within a day or two. Uh, f sometimes flying whatever vegetables that uh, you'd like to have, well, they were delivered. And it boasts the largest deep freeze in the world. Here is enough food to feed the camp for several months. Everything from steak to fruit salad. Saturday, 24th of December, 1960, Christmas Eve. Breakfast. Breakfast. We worked flat out to clear all the snow. The tunnel was quite full. Then, Dr. Shivago for the rest of the day. The new book of Dr. Shivago to read. It says Christmas menu, chilled tomato juice with lemon wedge, roast turkey, cranberry sauce, mashed tomatoes, browned sweet potatoes, buttered cream beans, buttered parsley corn, assorted crisp relishes, assorted rolls with butter, pumpkin pie and whipped cream, or Mince meat pie, assorted fresh fruit. In January 1961, a new American president takes the oath of office. John F. Kennedy inherits a difficult legacy. He must contain the Soviet Union without provoking a new world war. He swears to preserve, protect, and defend. Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. The communists have a special surprise for the new commander in chief. The Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin becomes the first human to journey into space. In April 1961, Gagarin's capsule Vostok 1 completes one orbit of the Earth. The space flight lasts 108 minutes. 108 minutes that change the world. Uh, 
and became much bigger celebration than of the launching of the first satellite. It was compared the uh, May 9, 1945, the end of the Second World War. So I remember when these cars uh, was moved on the through Moscow, the people standing in the balconies and the windows on the roofs, and then the reception and the fireworks. So it was a great celebration. It was no similar celebration later. I do not uh, regard the first man in space as a sign of the weakening of the, uh, of the uh, free world. But I do regard the total mobilization of men and uh, things for the service of the communist bloc over the last years as a source of great danger to us. The USA responds with a giant submarine building program. And like the Soviets, they expand their nuclear missile capabilities. They focus on missiles that can be launched from submarines traveling on the high seas. Now it's the Americans' turn to take the lead in the arms race. The USA sends the Nautilus to the North Pole, the world's first nuclear submarine. Parallel to the Navy, the Air Force also gets a nuclear missile the Minuteman, and there are plans for a similar rocket called Iceman to be stationed in Greenland under the ice. Before transferring any rockets to their launch pads, the scientists in Camp Century have to study the physical challenges involved. For this purpose, they build and test an underground railway track. Camp Century was the, the runner-up project for a much larger project known as Project Iceworm that involved building many uh, thousand kilometers of tunnels under the inland ice to have nuclear missiles uh, installed. Søren Gregersen takes three photos of these railway tracks beneath the ice, the only proof of the top secret nuclear arms project known as Iceworm. There was a long, especially large tunnel, a bit away from the other tunnels, uh, where you were pulling a, um, a wagon from, uh, a train wagon on rails back and forth, uh, loading it in one way, loading it in another way, uh, doing it a bit faster, doing it a bit slow, of, uh, testing, testing. Uh, and uh, we were thinking of well, going across the uh, glacier from one town to another town in Greenland. Camp Century becomes a testing site for numerous experiments, both military and civilian. Glaciologists extract one of the world's first ice core samples from deep inside a glacier, a fascinating archive of past climates. Søren takes part in many of these tests. The US soldiers study everything about their Arctic habitat, even testing hovercraft as a means of transport. In Camp Century, experiments are carried out not only on materials, but also on people. It was a social experiment. Um, the US Army conducted psychological research to find out how the soldiers um, felt about living in Camp Century in complete isolation and in very different uh, difficult circumstances. So they were not sure would, would they be able to cope with it or would there, would there be um, riots or, or uh, social problems. 
The Army's documentary footage portrays an idyllic world under the ice. In the outside world, however, the Cuban Missile Crisis is threatening to trigger a new world war. In 1962, Soviet ships deliver nuclear missiles to Cuba, right on America's doorstep. A threat on a scale hitherto unknown. The country is put on a war footing. Atomic bomb shelters are set up inside public buildings. Grocery stores, and not only those in Florida, are stripped bare as Americans succumb to panic buying. The army is on high alert. The president is openly threatening war on the Soviets. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. Kennedy's resolve catches Khrushchev off guard. Realizing he has overplayed his hand, the Soviet leader recalls his missiles from Cuba. His ships turn back. For Fidel Castro and his ally in Moscow, 1962 becomes a turning point. The future of Camp Century and Project Iceworm is also at stake in 1962. But the soldiers stationed there will be the last ones to learn of it. Project Iceworm was evaluated by the Department of Defense in 1962 under the Kennedy administration. And we know that this evaluation, even though it was favorable, uh, the Department of De Defense in the end uh, said no to Project Iceworm. After only a few years in operation, Camp Century is close to collapse. Despite the insulation, the heat coming from the houses is causing problems for the structure of the tunnels. The shifting glaciers also play their part. The piles of snow can no longer be cleared by hand. The ice cap is not a solid piece of ice. It's quite dynamic, in, in fact. So it moves all the time. It flows from the middle of the ice cap and towards the oceans. And this movement caused um, the, the, the tunnels of Camp Sentry to, to deform and eventually collapse. In 1966, the US Army has to abandon Camp Sentry. The road from Thule to the polar ice caps is still closed, as is the icy path to the camp, once marked with flags. The Army take their nuclear reactor with them as they leave, but everything else remains to be fossilized forever under the ice. But in an era of unprecedented climate change, there is no forever anymore. Station North, a Danish military base. It's the northernmost inhabited point in Greenland. From here, climate scientists are studying the ice sheets around the North Pole. Polar researchers from the German Alfred Wegener Institute are analyzing the sea ice, while others study the ice on land. Greenland's ice caps are melting, with repercussions for the entire world. But the melting ice is also bringing to light some long-forgotten secrets. According to climate predictions, the impact of Camp Century may yet be felt, 50 years after the project was consigned to the past.
When Camp Century was abandoned, most of the radioactive waste was left behind, with other toxic byproducts such as PCBs and vast quantities of diesel. Scientific forecasts predict that by the end of this century, a moving glacier could carry all this waste towards the bay near Thule. The ecological threats are very serious. Any nuclear waste is of ecological danger, regardless whether that's on ice or land. And uh, nuclear waste just left behind is not okay. That's a risk environmentally, that's a risk to the world ecology, and that's a risk on violating our rights on polluting our country without our acceptance. Aleka Hammond was the Prime Minister of Greenland and represented her country in the Danish Parliament. When glaciologists wrote about the risks posed by Camp Century, Hammond appealed to the government in Copenhagen for more information. But instead of answers, all she got back were excuses and obfuscation. To this day, nothing has changed. I see a big cover-up on this because uh, if it's not a cover-up, why is it that we take so many years for us to try to get any answer from Denmark? Why is it that when Denmark is not raising their hands towards the United States for polluting the ice cap in this sense? Why is it that we have to struggle and use lots of power, lots of energy, and lots of time to try to get any answer out of the foreign ministry of Denmark? If that's not a cover-up, what is it then? Eleka Hammond is a campaigner for Greenland's independence from Denmark. The next generation should not, in her view, suffer the consequences of historic contamination. The toxic remains of Camp Century must never be allowed to enter the food supply. I expect a surveillance. I expect a cleaning up. I expect uh, scientific research to check up and give an answer to all the questions that Greenland has given. The Swiss glaciologist Horst Machgut was, together with the Canadian researcher William Colgan, the first scientist to point out the environmental risks posed by Camp Century. In 2017, Denmark caved to pressure from Greenland and sent an international expedition to investigate the claims. Markut joined the researchers on their trip. A chartered plane drops the scientists at the spot where Camp Century once stood. They spend two weeks here, studying the ice around the abandoned site. From above, there is no trace of the settlement left. The tunnels and houses are buried under 60 years of snowfall. That's what's so exciting. You're standing in this endless white desert and beneath your feet are nearly 10,000 tons of waste. Summer 2017. The weather only permits a few days of research. Everything is still there, but because it's up to 200 feet under the ground and buried under at least 100 feet of snow, it's all as flat as a pancake. The glaciologists record data about the snowmelt and measure the underground layers with a radar, which they pull behind them on skis. This way, they can locate the toxic waste stored under the ice. They then extract ice samples from 200 feet below the surface in order to test them for radioactivity. Drilling into the waste itself is off limits. We had to promise not to drill into the toxic waste itself. We weren't equipped for that anyway. It would have been a huge risk for us. What will happen in the next 70 years? 
Will Camp Century free itself from its icy grave and end up in the sea near Thule? Studies show that the ice around the camp is indeed getting warmer, but dangerous levels of radioactivity have not yet been discovered. It will take further research expeditions and clear answers from Copenhagen, if indeed they ever come. While the authorities have published scientific data online, interview requests have been turned down, and the leaders of the expedition have been forbidden to talk about their findings. Denmark's silence on the matter means that the truth around Camp Century remains shrouded in secrecy, as does the missile research project known as Iceworm, which was carried out at the camp, but whose details are classified by the US government. But for better or worse, the melting of the ice caps will keep Camp Century in the public eye for years to come. And it's an achievement that should not be forgotten. The first ever human settlement built under the ice that accomplished what it was designed for, at least for six whole years. <laughs>